I like that image of the Eucharist, of the Mass, being the heartbeat of the Church. Truly, it is something founded by Christ, passed on by his immediate apostles and disciples to the living Church, and that each Sunday we are participating in that heartbeat in the constant beating heart, ultimately, of Christ, but, but we are able to actually participate in it. <coughs> and so it is the set of instructions, the general instruction in the, in the Missal, that is the means by which we are able to faithfully pass on from one generation to another the treasure that is our Eucharistic worship, that is that heartbeat. Our participation ultimately, in the death and resurrection of Christ that each of us has been baptized into. Each of us is a living part of. And so, the Eucharist becomes that treasure that is at the very center of our lives. And the liturgy, the, the texts, the prayers, the actions, everything that makes up the Mass, becomes an opportunity for us to ponder that mystery at work, truly alive in us. And as a means to participate in something that's greater than us, through the prayers and actions instituted by Christ, we are able to become obedient to Christ. And this is a key aspect of the liturgy. We receive from Christ 2,000 years ago and the apostolic tradition, the apostles, and the church that he founded, these prayers, these actions. They're not something that we make up for ourselves. They're something that we receive and therefore are able to become obedient to. As we are drawn into that obedience, we are no longer left to our own devices, we are now able to know Christ himself. The obedience that he showed to the Father as he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane and as he went to the cross in faith that his Father would not leave him. We are able in faith to know that our Father does not leave us, even in our own suffering, in our lives as we walk to the difficult times, the joyful times, we're able to see in all of them the working of Christ and the mystery of his resurrection that ultimately we are reminded of through the Eucharist, through the, through the celebration of Mass. And so we have this germ, again, not what's making me cough, but this general instruction of the Roman Missal that helps to pass on that tradition that helps us to be able to enter into and receive what Christ has left for us. And so this is the structure of the document. This is a, a copy of the latest edition, the 2002 General Instruction Roman Missal in English. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful document. It's available on the USCCB website, and any Catholic is able to buy it. I encourage everyone to have one because sections of it are very spiritually powerful, especially in the beginning, the first two, uh, well, the preamble and then the, the first chapter. So at the beginning, as we already talked about, Pope Paul VI introduced this preamble, or this, this first part, in which there are three parts. The first, talking about the unchanged faith, that our faith is unchanged since the time of Christ. And then, the unbroken tradition, that we have been in one line of tradition all along. And then, the need for accommodation of new conditions, which acts as the transition between the long-standing tradition of the Missal of Trent, that was used from the 1500s until the mid-1960s, <laughs> and this new general instruction. Chapter 1, the importance and dignity of the Eucharistic celebration. 
You remember that I mentioned that before, that already existed, that 1969 document. This importance of how the Eucharistic celebration, our attendance at Sunday Mass, our participation, is ultimately rooted in the dignity of Christ and the most important thing that we could possibly ever accomplish or do. Because it's not us accomplishing it, it is Christ. Chapter 2, the structure of the Mass, its elements, and its parts. Chapter 3, the duties and ministries in the Mass. So we're all familiar that the priest, as celebrant, has his responsibilities and duties. The altar servers, or acolytes, the lectors, instituted readers, they all have their responsibilities the laity have their responsibility to participate, to respond when referred to by the priest. And the priest says, the Lord be with you. And with the spirit. We have to respond. So we have our, our place, our duties. And so they're, they're laid out for us in chapter 3. And then chapter 4 goes to the different forms of celebrating the Mass. Mass with the congregation. I think we're all probably familiar with that one, hopefully. We come to Mass on Sunday and in the morning, and perhaps on daily Mass, and we, we attend with other faithful. A concelebrated Mass. These are celebrations of Mass where more than one priest gathers together, and the priests vest together in chasubles, or at least in an alb and a stole if they're concelebrating with another priest. And they together celebrate Mass. This means they each themselves extend their hands at the consecration and offer the gift of Calvary individually. And so they come, they with one another, celebrate the Mass. This is a very ancient way of celebrating the Mass, but had been, uh, and is, is done frequently, and has been in the Eastern Catholic Churches, the Byzantine Church, the Ukrainian Church, all those Eastern Catholic Churches, but in the Latin Church had been restricted to very few occasions previously. And so after the 1969 General Instruction, it became widely celebrated this way, where priests would concelebrate together, many times also with the congregation. And then the third type or form of celebrating the Mass is when the priest celebrates only with one minister participating. And so one person is there to make the responses and to participate so that the priest can celebrate Mass. A priest should always have at least one person with him when he celebrates Mass because that person reminds the priest and is a sign to all that as we heard in the video, the Mass is always celebrated in the midst of the living church. Even if because of absolute necessity the priest celebrates Mass by himself, he is still celebrating Mass in the presence of the entire living church, both militant, the church here on earth, and the church up in heaven. And so, are we truly recognizing as we go to Masses celebrated even with a congregation, that the angels and saints that everyone is present at each and every celebration. It's not just the community that's in the room, although they are certainly there, but that the whole church throughout the world, in some way, is present. 